Sat Two or IdeaSat, which is a three U CubeSat and the uh, second spacecraft in the Inspire program. So um, again, the uh, main payload of this mission is the compact ionospheric probe, which is an in situ plasma sensor, um, and uh, this. Uh, Instrument has uh, several operating modes: retarding potential analyzer, ion trap, ion drift meter, and uh, planar Langmuir probe. And um, it ha does have flight heritage from the Fomoset Five um, mission. Uh, CIP is also included as payload on Inspire Sat One and Inspire Sat Four and Six. So the spacecraft itself is uh, slightly overweight for a three U CubeSat. It's a uh, four point five kilograms. Um, in order to satisfy the payload requirements, it does have fairly high-end uh, attitude determination and control, which um, you can see towards the middle of the spacecraft over here. This is a, a commercial off-the-shelf unit from Blue Canyon Technologies, the exact, which ha again has heritage on past flights and includes an array of sensors and uh, actuators. The um, program was initiated in 2017. We went through preliminary design, uh, critical design, and uh, finally delivered the flight model um, in December and we just launched and are in the middle of the commissioning process. So um, we completed um, uh, integration and testing um, in the fall of 2020 and we delivered our spacecraft to the uh, launch services firm um, ISL in uh, the Netherlands in early December. And you can see here the photograph uh, photographs of our spacecraft arriving at the uh, uh, launch services provider inside uh, the acrylic shipping container. The spacecraft was unpackaged and then placed inside the deployment module that you can see over here. So our spacecraft is going up with uh, at least six others in this uh, deployment unit. And of course, um, this being our first experience with small spacecraft, we did have a few um, somewhat unpleasant surprises along the way, but uh, most notably the fact that the, uh, so the way CubeSats deploy is um, they're held inside um, a deployer using uh, four guide rails, and then there's a pusher plate with a spring at the back, which uh, pushes the spacecraft out um, once the launch vehicle reaches orbit. And what we found was um, there was a flaw in the uh, PCBs we used to design our solar panels. They'd become somewhat warped and were pushing against the, uh, the guide rails, increasing the uh, static friction that the uh, spring would have to overcome um, on deployment. So. We initially had some serious concerns about whether or not this might cause the spacecraft to not deploy on orbit. But fortunately, what happened was um, one of the deployer rails inside this particular deployer is dynamic, meaning that when the door opens, it slides outwards and, uh, and forwards, and that helps to overcome the uh, st initial static friction of the spacecraft inside the uh, deployment module. So the spacecraft was, again, integrated and uh, accepted, and then we uh, went up on the January 24th um, Falcon 9 uh, Transporter 1 um, flight. So this was a uh, day of launch. The launch was postponed several times. And uh, naturally, uh, this, you know, uh, this being our first spacecraft and any launch being a major event, we decided this was a very good excuse to hold a party in the uh, department. And so uh, we, uh, we held our first party on, um, let's see, Friday of two weeks ago. And then the uh, launch was scrubbed at uh, T minus um, four minutes. We thought that was great because that gave us an excuse for another party on Sunday. And um, then uh, fortunately uh, the spacecraft launched successfully on, on Sunday. And um, so on the live feed, we, saw, we were able to follow the uh, deployment all the way up to the spacecraft being ejected from the deployers. But of course uh, the, video, the video quality was too low to determine which spacecraft were being ejected when. So um, in order to determine whether our spacecraft was successfully deployed and functioning, we had to rely in large part on the amateur radio community to receive the uh, beacon signals that our spacecraft was sending out every 30 seconds. So a beacon is basically just a very small data packet that the spacecraft sends out at a regular interval. Um, by receiving the beacon, we can determine the spacecraft is A, alive, B, um, but if we're able to decode, demodulate and decode the data inside, we can get some more in-depth information on the uh, state of health of the spacecraft and again, we also know that the spacecraft is within um, line of sight. So within uh, four hours of launch, we received a report on the uh, satellite net from the satellite network of open ground stations or SATNOGS. So this is an online um, uh, uh, sort of database of contributing amateur radio stations that are working to track um, small satellites. Several of them were tracking our satellite um, since we were the newest launch and uh, a ground station in Europe picked up uh, our first beacon packet at roughly T plus four hours 
in this uh, diagram back here, you can see the uh, some of the pertinent fields in the uh, beacon that were received. And uh, so you can see the spacecraft was initially deployed to what we call safe mode in flight software. In this case, the spacecraft does the minimum amount of work necessary to sustain itself. It uh, charges the uh, solar panels on the day side by facing the sun and uh, on the night side, it basically sort of uh, goes into a low power mode. And so the spacecraft is in safe mode. And most importantly here, if you look at the um, middle of the right-hand side of the panel, SOC, state of charge, you can see that the state of charge of the spacecraft is quite healthy, 95.28%. We were very concerned initially that if the solar panels didn't deploy correctly, or if um, our attitude determination control subsystem was in, unable to find the sun, we might be short on power, but fortunately that has not been the case. You can also see here that the ADCS is in sun pointing mode, which is the uh, default safe mode of the ADCS, where it basically tries to maximize the irradiance um, from the sun on the uh, coarse sun sensor that we have mounted to the same face as the solar panels. Here you can see we, uh, also other data fields that are available, including uh, the temperature of various parts of the spacecraft, the current and voltage from various subsystems and the on off state of different uh, subsystems in general. The spacecraft was uh, functioning fine and based on the beacons that we continue to receive from SATNOGS, the spacecraft is in a, pre is in a pretty stable uh, safe mode state right now, just beaconing away and uh, generating more than enough power for its purposes. So um, uh, here was a lesson learned for us actually that uh, basically the amateur radio community is a very, very big asset uh, for your spacecraft when you're in the middle of commissioning, especially if you're not able to receive the uh, signal yourself. So, um, uh, so basically, um, the, uh, our beacon is designed so that the beacon period reflects the current operational state of the spacecraft. So you can see here, these are spectral waterfall plots. The x-axis is the frequency, the y-axis is time. And you can see that from these amateur radio ground stations, they were receiving a beacon packet every 30 seconds. And uh, so our spacecraft beacons every 30 seconds whenever it's in safe mode or nominal mode and every 60 seconds when it's um, in a very low power um, Phoenix mode. So fortunately we were picking up consistent uh, 30 second beacons everywhere indicating our spacecraft is in a safe state. So a lesson learned here is basically um, even if you can't, uh, even if ground stations are not capable of demodulating um, your signal, you can still make it in a way that you can uh, get useful information out of it. So uh, again, SATNOX has been a very uh, valuable asset. Um, a lot of stations are picking up our uh, spacecraft and we can check regularly to determine the state of our spacecraft. Um, and again, the amateur radio community was also um, very helpful in putting together uh, various decoding and demodulation uh, packages for various open source uh, software that can be used to uh, decode and demodulate our spacecraft signal. We are very quick about publicizing um, our uh, beacon packet format to the amateur radio community. And that's really helped to encourage a lot of interest in receiving our beacons and publicizing the data. Hey, Lauren, can so I ask again, a question is... about that? Oh. Because yep. it's in the US at least, it's becoming nearly impossible for science CubeSats to use amateur radio band anymore. So we are not for my CubeSat. And so what you're saying is, has me a little bit worried that um, I mean I think that I think your experience is consistent with with other CubeSats that the amateur community has been extremely helpful and I'm just curious if you have thoughts about that. It sounds like at least you this um, timing thing that you're doing could could be picked up even if they can't decode it. Is that well maybe not if they just don't have an antenna in the right frequency range. Yeah, so um, in order to um, uh, have your spacecraft accepted by most launch providers, they will ask for frequency coordination by some regulatory authority. If you're using the amateur radio frequencies, this would be the uh, International Amateur Radio Union or IARU. Right. And uh, my understanding is basically IARU uh, initially was um, uh, fairly easy to approach in terms of uh, performing frequency coordination for um, uh, university spacecraft. However, in recent years, they've um, been concerned that um, the amateur radio bands are getting too crowded with uh, small spacecraft. So they've been more explicit about um, requiring uh, certain amateur radio functionality that's open to the community in uh, small spacecraft that they perform frequency coordination for. So for example, for our spacecraft, we did include a, um, a function where it can serve as a, a, a repeater for a data packets sent via radio um, provided the spacecraft is not in safe mode and is in a state that we feel is uh, safe to uh, allow that. 
I wonder if this is something we should talk more about in terms of coordinating you know, for the constellation, because we were basically told that we would not be given the license in the amateur band for our NASA. Yes, yeah. yes. Uh, this okay. is um, certainly a very pertinent issue that has to be considered um, in terms of, for example, uh, coming to some mutual accommodation with the amateur radio community, and uh, also in terms of whether or not, um, if we're going to launch in constellation, if there's some type of group type of uh, arrangement that we can make. Yeah, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I, I didn't want to forget no to ask because it's really important, I think. It is, it is. Uh, okay. All right, so uh, the spacecraft right now is in a pretty stable uh, safe mode. It's beaconing uh, its signal consistently. Based on the uh, beacon packages we've received, the uh, attitude is stable. It's maintaining sun pointing mode. GPS is functional, and um, we now have an attitude solution from the star tracker. One uncertainty that has arisen is uh, since we were deployed, alongside several other small satellites on this rideshare mission, there's a bit of confusion right now in terms of which set of orbit elements corresponds to what spacecraft. So currently we're working to perform orbit determination using the GPS ephemeris that's come down with the beacon packets. Um, and again, the battery state of health is very healthy and we're pretty relieved about that. That said, we have had a few major anomalies after launch. The first one, which is a bit embarrassing, um, but fortunately was one we've been able to recover from was basically after the spacecraft was launched, uh, amateur radio stations were picking up our beacons everywhere. And our, uh, the, it seemed like the only people who couldn't pick up our spacecraft was basically us. And um, uh, we found that this was uh, due to the fact that our ground station has uh, been, uh, has been uh, uh, functioning for some time, about six years, and uh, is sort of lacking in terms of regular maintenance. So we, had, so we spent the last week basically doing ground station maintenance and recalibration. So to give you an idea of what sort of a uh, uh, problems we're talking about. One of the tests we performed is a sun pointing test where we try and point our antenna at the sun and then uh, and then uh, use the sun as a calibration radio source to uh, ensure that we're pointing in an accurate direction. And so in the spectral plot, you can see on the left hand side, you can see a green line and a yellow line. So the green line is the power we received when we thought we were pointing at the sun initially before calibration. And then after we applied a 15 degree elevation angle offset, you can see the yellow contour is the power we received when we uh, were sure the antenna was actually was pointing at the sun. So we were off by about 15 degrees and this causes a, a three decibel or basically a reduction in, in received power by half, which really uh, weakens the signal we received. So after we performed this calibration test, we were able to pick up beacon packets, at least their, their spectral signatures um, at our ground station whenever uh, IS-2 flew by. Um, so you can see uh, some of the uh, spectral characteristics of a GMSK modulated packet, basically two stronger uh, frequencies on either end and then sort of uh, a baseband in the middle. But the signal is still, still too weak for us to actually demodulate and decode to determine what the content was. Basically, it was uh, we had a signal to noise ratio at best of only roughly 10 decibels. So we went through and we basically went and uh, replaced our antennas, the cabling, the rotator, low noise amplifier, the whole works. And uh, after doing that, um, we were able to get a much stronger signal. We are now able to receive and demodulate the beacon packets ourselves. And uh, again, this is very important in the spacecraft commissioning process, being able to monitor the, uh, our spacecraft state by ourselves. Uh, the other anomaly was respect, with respect to the uh, ADCS on board. The, uh, again, we're using the exact um, ADCS module from Blue Canyon Technologies. And we had an anomaly where for the first five days on orbit, the star tracker on the exact just was not returning an attitude solution. So as you may, as you may know, um, the purpose of the star tracker is to determine the orientation of the spacecraft with respect to the celestial sphere. And once we have that initial attitude uh, solution, then we can start to engage in much more um, complex types of attitude control, including pointing at targets on the surface of the earth, orienting the spacecraft so CIP is pointed in the RAM direction for science mode and so forth. And so in the beacons we received during the first five days, for some unknown reason, the uh, attitude solution that we received, as you can see in this decoded beacon packet on the right-hand side, was always, uh, was always um, incorrect. Basically, the star track was unable to provide an, a, a star, uh, an attitude solution. And the reason for this was give, that was given in the beacon packet was too few stars. So initially, we were actually extremely concerned that um, it was possible that the solar panel on the side of the star tracker, as you can see in the middle diagram, we were very concerned that that solar panel might be partially or 
even completely undeployed and blocking the uh, view of the uh, star tracker. And of course, this was complicated by the time that we didn't have a, communi a communications link with our spacecraft directly at the time. So we had no way of issuing commands. Fortunately, our onboard flight software has a mode where basically if it detects any anomalies um, with any of the uh, subsystems or if a subsystem fails to respond for too long, it will basically power cycle that subsystem. So what happened was about um, at about T plus five days, we noticed that uh, the star tracker suddenly started to provide valid uh, attitude solutions. And when we looked at our beacon packet, we discovered that uh, basically the ADCS had actually been power cycled by our flight software. And so apparently after be being power cycled, the um, star tracker seems to work fine now and we can engage in uh, uh, fine reference pointing um, now for the ADCS and for uh, the upcoming science mode. So right now in the middle of the commissioning stage, um, we verified that the beacon downlink is functional and the uh, spacecraft state of charge is stable. Next steps are to verify command uplink and also uh, start downlinking uh, saved uh, beacon packets, which are basically stored flight data on the SD card using both UHF and S-band. S-band is also going to be used for the larger volume science data. Once these uh, functions are verified, then we will be able to begin science operations and, uh, and uh, basically uplink the command to set our spacecraft to nominal mode. So that's the current state of IS-2, and we're hopeful that we can complete this. Thank you, Lauren. And we have better, better wrap up here. Thank you. And uh, thank you very much for the positive report. And could we, let me share my screen now, if you could relinquish the screen. Sure. And uh, we have several distinguished guests here. So I'd like to welcome Eber and, and uh, Len and Fred and, um, thank you guys for, for joining. Just a reminder what this, um, sort of going backwards a little bit here, but reminding what this task group is about. And uh, I guess, Len, we're regarding this as, as a part of our reporting out, at least. You've seen one exciting example of what's been happening with small spacecraft. The, um, the fact that the INSPIRE program is, uh, is reaching fruition now and small spacecraft are being launched and, and getting results back is very exciting to us. So um, we appreciate the chance to have this, these breakout sessions here at Coast Bar and a chance to talk about what, we're, what we've done and what we're hoping to do. Don't need to tell you folks that the small spacecraft missions have been on people's minds for a long time going back of course, Len, as you remember, the SMEX program that you initiated uh, at NASA has paid lots of dividends. The university class or steady class missions have done a lot. But uh, now we've moved into this new era of the CubeSats and, and the small sats are becoming increasingly powerful and capable. Um, as you also recall, the um, Coast Bar strategic plan really called on the members to explore the possibility of, of uh, assembling this international consortium to develop, launch, and acquire data from Constellation of Small Spacecraft. And uh, I'd really say we're on that road now. The uh, idea is that um, this could be particularly useful for making measurements near Earth, ionospheric kind of measurements, and the um, application of those results to space weather, understanding the space weather system. It's of course um, one of the initial visions, but there's a lot more that can be done. So this is the uh, task group membership, of course, with which we've been working. Um, Amal, uh, Lauren, Mustafa, are, uh, are all very active in the INSPIRE program and are, wor are working on those spacecraft now. And uh, essentially all the people on the task group are passionate about and involved in one way or another with small spacecraft kind of uh, missions. And so we're very excited uh, to be um, aware not only of what's going on in, in um, the United States, but around the world in small spacecraft. We've, uh, we got started, we really got going just about the time that the COVID pandemic shut down the world. 
but we've been um, having uh, biweekly uh, meetings uh, via Zoom, and um, we've been considering a number of issues that were um, urged on us by the uh, when the task group was set up. The uh, trying to look at what would constitute appropriate small uh, small spacecraft design, uh, what would what should or should not be done as far as uh, standard bus uh, aspects. Certainly, have been crucially interested in looking at um, access to space and uh, also focusing on how, how best to organize around ground systems and communication aspects and uh, paying particular attention to what this Coast Bar program could do to assure that there would be good data archiving, sharing and, and standard approaches there. We've, uh, we've certainly concluded that uh, and understood deeply that Coast Bar can't afford to pay for the uh, small set constellation program uh, by any means, but that it can be an honest broker, that the constellation of small spacecraft should be organized around um, the idea of a grassroots approach. People bring what they are able to bring and um, we'll try to get this to work together. This should be not uh, a top-down program, but should really be a bottom-up kind of program and uh, uh, self-organizing as possible and necessary. And then defining the kind of structure and framework and uh, soliciting contributions and support uh, from, from the agencies or from um, corporations or whatever we can in order to support launch and data efforts. And we've recognized that there are really two distinct aspects for the action plan that we're, we're espousing. One branch should really be geared toward harnessing this immense power of the current worldwide revolution in small sat capabilities. And again, Inspire, as Lauren has nicely described here, is, is one example of that, or maybe a sterling example. And uh, uh, Mustafa launched his spacecraft on the same um, SpaceX uh, launch that Lauren did, and Amal has been busy um, finalizing, I guess you could say, the, uh, the uh, work with his uh, Inspire sat. And uh, the um, work with this task group has really revealed that there is just an immense amount going on around the world, and many, many people want to really um, add their capabilities into the, effectively the Coast Bar Constellation. But the second branch uh, that we have been uh, very interested in and very focused on is that the Constellation uh, effort should also be used to build capacity amongst the nations and the institutions that have little or no present space involvement. And so we've been trying to have um, various mechanisms through contacts uh, out to institutions around the world through um, webinars and uh, town halls and, and uh, various mechanisms to make more people aware. And we uh, have been trying to do that at the Coast Bar uh, Assembly itself to make sure that people are more aware that this is going on and um, seeking to get people to um, engage with us who really want to learn more about how to do this uh, small set of business. And so there we've um, sort of after the fact, uh, I guess you could say, uh, thanks to the organizers and to uh, Coast Bar for fitting us in, but we've uh, had many members, several members from the task group go to various of the uh, sessions and present um, uh, talks, videos about the um, about the task group's work and about the opportunity. And so this has been done for earth science, for planetary science, for astrophysics, and for, um, you know, really across the board to try to engage and enlist with folks. And I think we've had um, at least the opportunity to reach a number of people through this mechanism. So our goals for this session are really to uh, report out, as I say, to share the present thinking that we've had about the, the constellation. 
everything we've been trying to do has to has to uh, been really to build the grassroots interest in the Coast Bar program. Uh, we've solicited ideas through our town halls and webinars uh, and uh, through our news uh, letters and uh, and uh, through Coast Bar publications, trying to solicit ideas from the community. We've engaged, uh, I think, a number of new institutions and researchers through us, and we're happy to answer uh, questions. So uh, with that, I would uh, I would say we, if there are questions or comments from from the attendees or so, um, I guess we are we able to hear the participants, the attendees, Jean Claude, or are we are they prohibited from talking to us? No, no, I can promote them and allow them to talk if need. Okay. If they could just raise their hands if they want to do so, that that's easy enough. So I know Fred was on was in a session today uh, for that uh, Lauren and Amal organized and and heard some of uh, this from from Lauren and uh, I know that Len is intimately familiar with uh, with the setup of this at least but I think uh, we can report Len that we've had um, considerable success uh, especially under the kind of challenging. Um, COVID conditions that we've uh, we've been able to keep doing our work. And I think we now want to make sure that we move to the next phase where we start focusing on specific science questions and that we start- I can, to... Dan, I can probably, uh, since there's a, a small number of, uh, of external yeah. participants, I could promote them to panelists if you want. Yeah, why don't, why don't you just do that? Okay. Looks like Len had his hand up. Yeah, well, I'm just allowing him to join. That will be easier. And uh, and Fred, and here. And Dan, hello. Dan. We found that Jean Claude operates best when it's three o'clock in the morning. So yeah, he's a, a nighttime party animal. <laughs> oh, let me hello, see. Dan, hello, Hall. If you want also a short presentation about Inspire Five, you can. Yeah, we, we will. And we'll, uh, we'd also like to have a short presentation from Dr. Dai again of his, his work. Let's just see uh, whether there are any comments or so from from uh, the attendees, and then we'll we'll go on and have a couple of other presentations. Okay. Oh, very good. Yeah. Yeah, I, I tried to connect uh, at the beginning, but as a panelist, but uh, I, I couldn't succeed. So mm. I can just uh, participate as a participant. So thanks, uh, Jean-Claude. Now I can see you and uh, talk to the others. Uh, I, I was uh, in another meeting for our first breakout session and uh, our Professor Daly has presented uh, one uh, short presentation. I wonder if you have any feedback for that. We had a very sparse attendance at the first at the first meeting. Uh, we recorded his uh, his talk, and it's been available. I haven't personally seen any um, any response to his his presentation, okay. but um, but with the people's agreement, I think we could have another short presentation from him now. Maybe just uh, talk about his program and. I would also like to allow Mustafa to talk about how things are going for his recently launched small sat as well. Okay. Okay. So, so Len, uh, Len had his hand up a little. Yeah, Len. Thank you for including me in this. And by the way, thank you for the briefing. Uh, fortunately, it's only nine o'clock my time in the evening. So I have some hope of being awake here. Um, uh, did you uh, hear uh, the Space Agency Roundtable? by the way. I did um, not. Uh, if you're asking me, I did not hear that. No. I, I um, did. Yeah, I was going to ask about um, Thomas the, gave a nice uh, uh, Zerbukin gave a nice sort of shout out for, you know, the, the committee, the TGISS committee, you know, it's uh, maybe there's an opportunity there. That's, yeah, we regard it as such. And I think Amal is all over that now. And I think he's going to be working with Thomas's staff to, to make sure that we we respond to the door that was opened there. Yeah, I think it's kind of nice because it's, I mean, it's, uh, it's always uh, 
you know, I think one of the keys to this is finding a space agency someplace that wants to wants to help yeah. come in and uh, be turn it into a, a real program. And uh, uh, you know, there was um, some hope I thought for a while in uh, ESA as well, but that's uh, you know they've got changes in leadership and others, so it's not quite so clear as as to what's right. there. But uh, uh, Thomas has a big program, so. You know, if he wants to play, that would be, uh, I think that would take us a long way. And and then, you know, I, I, you know, perhaps there, I mean, this is the beauty of this is that it's really a international program and, the, you know, there are multiple agencies. Maybe we'll even find a way for uh, NASA and, the, and uh, our Chinese colleagues to work together. Wouldn't that be something else to think about? So it's, uh, yeah. Yeah. No, I think I yes, so. we do need uh, we do need uh, launchers. Uh, we we need operations uh, for, for our future constellation. So yeah. it is better to let agency knows uh, what is happening. Yeah. Good. Anyway, but thank you for the briefing so far. And I, and I, you know, I've been cheering you on for from from the very beginning because it's uh, you know this this was one of the things that came out of our you know strategic action plan for Coast Guard and uh, and one that. That you know, I happen to personally believe in. So uh, well, that's good. Thank, thank you, you, Lynn, and thanks for supporting this. And uh, I can tell you that uh, for the North American Town Hall that we held, uh, we got some very interested responses. Um, and uh, Amal and I've been working with uh, Spire that really wants to use their, their kind <coughs> of open um, opportunities for people to put uh, instruments on some of their spacecraft and maybe help launch things and stuff. So commercial side and of course in uh, in the Asia um, Oceana uh, town hall there was immense interest expressed by both uh, both the agencies and uh, and uh, corporate interests and so uh, I think we can be very encouraged that um, that there's a lot of enthusiasm and that we ought to capitalize on it so Robin did you have something you wanted to say yeah, I was just going to open the discussion of um, the program that Thomas, well, he said there's a, an RFI that's going to come out soon was matching U.S. universities with universities around the world to collaborate in, in building a satellite. And with the, I don't know, Amal, you probably have more information, but um, so one question I had was what's the role for our task group in terms of can we help? connect people, um, those partners, um, maybe come up with a list of prioritized science ideas that they could then develop requirements to for their own CubeSat or, you know, thinking about what is our role um, moving forward to, to take advantage of this. And Amal, you've, it sounds like you've talked with them a little more detail. Yeah, I have talked to uh, Thomas's office regarding regarding this RFI. So, um, you know, we've had a couple of discussions and uh, his office had told me that Thomas would be making an announcement at um, at COSPAR regarding you know how this would be structured, but it's still at an RFI stage. Uh, but they really do want to include a um, you know a not just a scientific collaboration, but a hardware element to this collaboration, which is great, um, and include capacity building. So again, these are going to be mainly science missions, uh, but with active capacity building elements where the U.S. institutions can work together with international partners for either instrument development or full spacecraft development. Uh, so I think this fits in really nice with the nicely with the task group agenda, where we, if we have a say an overarching science objectives that we have identified and instruments and institutes want to either contribute instruments that achieve those measurements and we want to develop the spacecraft together, uh, then there is a feasibility for US institutions to approach NASA for funding. Uh, within this um, with this call, uh, I think what we need to really, uh, you know, in follow up discussions with uh, Dr. Surbegin's office is that we need to emphasize that uh, the funding for this call that comes out needs to be at appropriate levels that you know we can we can act actually engage in and get productive results out of that. I think we can report to uh, to Coast Bar Lynn that. Um, that we've tried to be cognizant of other things that are going on within Coast Bar. We know that there's a space weather uh, sort of standing committee. Uh, we know that there's a capacity building committee. 
So we've been trying to meet with, with those mm -hmm. folks and trying to understand what our task group can do to, to fill the gaps rather than to step on other people's toes. And I think uh, some of the things we're hearing about here now are, are exactly the kinds of things that um, if, this, if you choose for this task group to continue its work, that's what we would try to do is to- this, this, this These are lifetime. Pardon me? These were lifetime employees and appointments. These were lifetime appointments, just in case uh, you were interested. I'm sorry to hear that. Thank you. <laughs> but we do need uh, after the COSPAR meeting. Yes, hello. Yes, uh, I, I would like to say uh, uh, we, we, are we were discussing the second phase. So after COSPAR, we would go move, we would move forward a little bit. Uh, right now we are discussing uh, how to uh, organize all this, but uh, next step we would like to, to focus on, uh, on the definitions. So once we have definitions, so we, we, will, uh, we will call for participations, then it will go more solid. So right now it's still on the top. We are still on the top. Yeah, I think a question though is how prescribed should it be from this group versus a list of kind of science objectives? I mean, working with the space weather task or um, roadmap group, I mean, they've already got a list of space weather objectives. So in terms of actual requirements for the instrument and spacecraft, you know, I'm still a little unclear on how far we should go versus I think the idea with this new program is that those universities would be developing the requirements as part of that learning process. Um, so I think that's something we need to sort out amongst our group is, is exactly how far we go with requirements development. <clears throat> but you're right. I mean, we're still talking in the top. <laughs> I agree with that. Well, I think we, there's been broad agreement that we want to evolve more toward a steering committee rather than the task group uh, that does, tries to do uh, an action plan that we really want to be a steering group. We want to encourage work, of course, in space weather, but we also have recognized that there are a lot of people who want to work in other other domains and would still like to work under the Coast Guard umbrella. So um, I think I think it's really important that we not try to or not think of ourselves this this appointed group as as trying to do everything, but trying to really encourage others to pick up and run with whatever they would like to do. And, and we just try to steer this and, and um, cross fertilize between the different uh, parts of the community that want to do it. Just a couple of things. Maybe oh, yeah. I'll defer to you, Len, but I do have something to say. Thank, thank you. I just, uh, just, a, just a couple of thoughts. I mean, uh, uh, one of the things I guess would be helpful to think about is is almost a roadmap for how this would happen. You know, where you, where you begin to think, I mean, you've got all these pieces mm -hmm. and, uh, and it's, it, you know, it, there's a lot of things that are not naturally self-organizing, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, you, you want to think about the fact that you don't do it, you know, maybe, you know, you point to the fact that someone else is going to do it and, but, you know, but within the Coast Bar family, you know, it'd be kind of nice if we sort of had a sort of a, a sort of a roadmap plan for how we would how this how you could bring the assets of Coast Bar uh, together. And, and, and that, you know, that you, you know what they are and I can help you with that. And and, and because, uh, we, you know, when you sort of stand down and sort of pass the torch, uh, you know, it's kind of, I, I think it would be kind of nice to have a sort of a plan for, for, for how, how you, how we could invoke all these things. Well, just, we, we are pointing, by the way, on, on Thomas. Why don't you invite him to one of your meetings? He'll come. And that may be the most direct way to, to, uh, you know, have an interaction on that issue. If it's a bit, yeah, we, we met with him and Hertzlia, you remember, and sort of laid out what, uh, where okay. we were. But, yeah. but anyway, um, we, are, we are also pointing to things like Inspire, which has, you know, organized around um, ionospheric space weather kind of stuff yeah. as, as, an, as a, like, I guess you could say a good example of how things can happen when people really start to work together collaboratively and maybe hold it up as an example. But uh, we, we want to encourage other other uh, sub-communities like that to uh, 
kind of think about doing the same kind of thing. But yeah. I think uh, I think you're right. I mean, I think we we could present a vision. We've been trying to present a vision and then get feedback for that vision from these various kind of meetings and and uh, newsletter. I mean, there there are some. Uh, I mean, uh, and again, these are decisions you're going to make. I'm, I'm a personal fan, actually, of the honosphere version of this thing. Just yeah, because. yeah, yeah. I mean, it's great. And, and, and the reason is very simple. I mean, you know, space weather is something that is of current of interest of many countries and, and, mm -hmm. uh, and, and satellites in the ionosphere can be quite simple. They you know, right. are ones that are readily lend themselves to small satellites. And also, uh, uh, you know, that, I mean, it's, it's what, like any weather phenomena, density of measurements is the key. Yeah. And, and that's we don't have that in uh, in, in space awesome. weather, and, and so so that that's a natural. I don't know if it's the only one. I don't know if there's you know people want to pursue that. That's not I'm not trying to prejudice that in any way, but there is a certain uh, uh, you know there in in other parts of my life. You know I worry about you know uh, plans for space weather and things like mm -hmm. that and, and it, yeah. this one just struck me as a no, I think it was a it was a great place to start and uh, and it, uh, it had already uh, borne out that that was that's true and it, that's where uh, where things are off and running but I think they're going to be other up to Eva what did you want to say um so what I wanted to say related to the structure and the the approach I mean, as, as you might know, I, I rather like the QB50 approach since um, we already flew an Inspire 2 satellite uh, a couple of years ago, amusingly. Um, but, I, but, but the thing that I like about the, the QB50 part is that you can have partners from all around the world. They might uh, have on each of the satellites, you know, an instrument from a common set that might be provided um, and then they put their own things uh, on as well. And so that way you get some shared uh, data that you want, that well, the, the group as a whole wants, whether it's ionospheric plasma density or magnetic field measurements or whatever else. Um, but you also allow them to do what interests them. You know, they might have an interest in, let's say, quantum communications or something. And so they put some some part of their satellite is connected with that and other parts are connected with other things. And, you know, QB50 worked in some ways and didn't work well in others, uh, as you're well aware. Um, but that sort, of, that sort of common framework where you can opt into parts and opt out uh, is, is quite flexible. It allows you to have universities, but also um, government labs, for instance. And you could have a generalization where you say, well, you know, country X uh, is, has a certain amount of money and they want to develop capacity, let's say. And so they put together, you know, M um, uh, CubeSats. Um, and it's flexible, but another country has a different number, a different budget, a different approach. And so it allows people to be more top down managed uh, from a a national point of view, or coming up from the bottom. Um, and that was very relevant for us in Australia, where, as you know, we had no space agency, we had no, no state or uh, Commonwealth or federal uh, money at all uh, for our CubeSats. And we scrimped and borrowed uh, and, and put uh, uh, three up, two of which worked. Um, and so that it's, you're going to have that range. And I think that's what you want to have a right. You want to have that range. I think you want to have uh, instruments in general that are devoted towards some common goals. And I'm, I'm like Len, I, I prefer um, uh, being relatively close to home, uh, ha having the ionosphere as part of it, uh, but space weather for the ionosphere. And that also allows you to connect to things in a, like in Australia, which matter increasingly, which is in fact, it's the only part the space agency supports is the commercial <laughs> aspects. Um, so I like the broad church idea uh, there. And I, I think it, it has something to be um, commended uh, to you. And you can imagine, um, you know, NASA and others, um, you know, with a, with a larger pot of money, uh, deciding on what instruments that they like 
and they offer those. Um, you could pay or not, as the case might be. You have the flexibility for others just producing their own. Um, so I guess I like that approach. Um, and, and you'll have to see whether it, it works out for you. Um, well, let me say that um, we, um, we as a committee have been honest amongst ourselves. I think we're amongst friends here so we can say that we, we look somewhat warily at, uh, at the agencies getting too involved and, and uh, taking things over and dictating uh, more what, what is to be done rather than uh, assuring that this uh, continues to have this kind of um, this structure where people can bring all kinds of um, capabilities to the table and still feel comfortable uh, joining and, and making a productive contribution. So, so uh, uh, I think we've all seen examples where things started out going pretty well and then an agency uh, steps in and uh, becomes a little too structured and a little too complicated and a little too to uh, costly and things like that for, for the small players to continue to play. So, so I, think, uh, I think you're wise on that, by the way. I think you're <laughs> wise, wise to be skeptical of having someone who used to run an agency. So, uh, yeah. uh, but, uh, uh, but, you know, the kind of the ideal arrangement is, uh, I would guess is, you know, you figure out what you want. Right. And then you then you sort of approach the agencies and, and say you know you know can you uh, can you help? And, I, I think uh, G was uh, was yes. I, I think the I think the good thing for us is we are we are starting from cost bar. So we are on top of all the agencies. So we will never lose the leadership of uh, cost bar. So uh, I agree with uh, Eva that uh, uh, Cube Fifty is is a good model. So, but still, Cosbar is uh, sitting in the center and coding participation. Some agency can participate more and some are less, but still Cosbar leading everything. We are organizing everything. So, uh, uh, and for the topic, Space Weather has been agreed by our group uh, from the back beginning. So we, we will stay for that. And once we have this first, we could discuss the second uh, topic for the second uh, constellation. So the first consideration for, for space weather is good. So what uh, my proposal is we have to uh, call, we have to send a call for proposals and then we discuss with the post proposals and to select one proposal uh, with, uh, with the most uh, 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 scientific objective are accommodated. And then we could uh, do a design, consideration design. And then with that definition, we can we can have uh, more participations. Uh, we may have 50, we may have uh, 100 uh, CubeSat or small satellite. So that comes uh, naturally later on. At the beginning, we just have to define our objectives. If, if I can actually, the, the natural thing for the agencies to do is to uh, help assure access to space it can provide, um, you know, sort of a, a stable framework. It can maybe help with the um, acquisition. Yes, but, but they will ask uh, what kind of, uh, how many satellites, uh, uh, how, how, what is the mass, and uh, how we can contribute. So without a definition, they cannot uh, participate. Well, I, uh, I don't think we have to necessarily even dictate that this is uh, only 3U CubeSats or only 6U CubeSats or something like that. I think I, I, we've really wanted to make it more flexible so that if, if in the judgment of the, the team that, uh, that somebody brings an idea and we think that this would contribute materially to the goals of the, uh, of the constellation, that, that we could be pretty tolerant of different kinds of um, satellite architecture and different sizes and things like that. And, yes. and again, COSPAR, this committee can be the, um, the agent for um, helping to make these things happen, facilitating without necessarily uh, providing resources to make it happen. The, uh, whether it's a country or a commercial outfit, or whether it's uh, you know um, a uh, a particular uh, university that's trying to get into the space business or whatever it might be, I think we can be pretty open to letting uh, people be active participants at a range of scales. That that would be my view. 
Yes, I, I fully agree with you, uh, Dan. But I think the first step probably is to have more information about the scientific objective, what's possible yeah. to do, yeah. because we don't know if we develop an imaging system or another solution. Yeah. It depends about the topics. If we would like yeah. to observe for space weather, um, yeah. for example, Liman Alpha is a good um, thing to do. But mm -hmm. after, for the technology, we need also to, to, to go on lesson learned. And probably first step is to develop a, a pathfinder. Yeah. Because yeah. If we start yeah. with the constellation first, it could be a problem. Right. No, I, and I think that's what we've, uh, we've pretty much have decided as a, as a task group is that we wanted to adhere to the idea that the ionospheric space weather was, was really the, the pilot activity, the one that was a demonstration of what was possible, what was desirable. And, uh, and then that uh, other opportunities could naturally um, arise uh, after this. And we'd you know, have other groups that would work on those things. But, um, so let's see, um, Mustafa, would you like to uh, present briefly um, how things are going for yours? I think it'd be interesting uh, for people yes, to it's hear a, a quick presentation there too. Yes. How many times you give me five minutes or more? Yeah, so like five minutes or so if you could. Uh, yes. So I can share that one. So I will show you what we do with um, Inspire 5, um, which is UVSQSAT and the number five of uh, our consortium. Um, it is a small CubeSat. So we are interesting about um, incoming solar radiation and outgoing shortwave radiation. Uh, this one is for um, radiative budget of the Earth. And we test also some new photodiode with a new technology. And for these topics, uh, we are interesting about solar spectral irradiance and particularly to see the link with the Erzberg continuum. But we are very interesting about space weather also. Um, thank you to Inspire team because they help us full time, all time. Um, here we have um, all part of the program from the spacecraft to the operation. And now we are in the operation mode. Uh, we have a very good help from uh, um, LASP, but also from National Central University, Nanyang, and AMSAT francophone, and also um, all topics. Here you can see what we want to do and why we have interest for the constellation. We need to have many spacecraft uh, on orbit to, to track um, the information. And we start with only one spacecraft, one pathfinder to do measurement and to test the technology. So uh, we were on board the same launcher than Inspire 2. So at the beginning of this meeting, you have a presentation from Lorraine. Uh, it was very amazing launch. So we have a picture about the 143 mm -hmm. spacecraft on board this launch. And we have a scale about small spacecraft, small CubeSat, according to the size of the um, launcher location for the spacecraft. Um, I have a short movie, but I will show you after. So now I will show you some results because we start the operation. Uh, first step, we need to modify something in our reception system. Uh, we have a problem with emission and we now it's a success uh, with the help of the Inspire group and with the help of AMSAT francophone and all radio amateur community, we modify um, the element to send some telecommand to the spacecraft. What we see, there is a modification of the characteristic and the parameter of the uh, transmission board. It is not the same when you do the test on ground and when you do the test in space, so there is some modification. So we see a variation in the modulation, also impact on the power. So we go directly to a numerical uh, solution uh, using a SDR solution. So we did not use the TS2000, which is analogic solution. Um, we have also very good help of the SATNOX network. All these people help us to, uh, to keep all the beacon. So we have um, now more than eight days of beacon data. Uh, we have also a Grafana solution 
to see uh, all time uh, the evolution of our parameters. So we start at the beginning with the safe mode. Um, it was the 24th January after we go to the standby mode. And uh, today we start the science mode. So here is an example about the evolution of the voltage of the spacecraft. So all is nominal. So we start at 7.5 because we deliver the spacecraft uh, end of October. So we know that we have this level of voltage. So we have an increase. Uh, we see the impact of the eclipse because the orbit is uh, particular um, and there is uh, more than 2000 seconds of eclipses. Mm -hmm. And in end of February, we will not have eclipse. So we will have a full sun observation. Uh, this one is evolution of temperature. It is close to our uh, simulation. So we use for that one a comparison with tools like ESATAN, ESARAD, which is European tools. So it is very good, the link with that one. Um, we see also the impact of the uncalibrated flux data. So we have already some results, but it is not calibrated. And in this picture, you can see we have full data for one orbit. So we have a data each 20 seconds. We can go more. Uh, this is the first scientific light and result is very, very interesting because with that one, we can link to go to the um, uh, radiative budget one day huh, only huh? because with one spacecraft, it's possible to have a map, but we need to have 15 days data to, to develop a map. So if you want, I have a short movie, but if we have no time, I don't know, Dan. Huh? Yeah, why don't you why don't you go ahead and show the movie? That'd be fine. Okay. Designed by Latmos, UVSQSAT is a French nano satellite dedicated to the observation of the sun and the earth. Its objective is to collect data on the Earth's energy imbalance that determines climate change. This energy imbalance is mainly caused by the increase of CO2 concentration in the atmosphere. UVSQ SAT fits in the hand and weighs less than two kilograms. Yet it carries the hopes of the scientists, engineers, and technicians of LATMOS and OVSQ. With this nano satellite, the team aims to implement a constellation of small satellites to better understand the mechanism of global warming. A constellation of many small satellites would make it possible to finally capture the spatiotemporal variations in the Earth's energy imbalance at the top of the atmosphere and the parameters that control them. These data are fundamental for testing climate models. About the size of a Rubik's Cube, UVSQSAT is equipped with a multitude of sensors inherited from the technological progress of miniaturization to measure the three terms of the Earth's radiation balance. Solar radiation arriving on the Earth, solar radiation reflected by the Earth, and infrared radiation emitted by the Earth. The mission is therefore multiple. This small concentrate of cutting edge technology thus makes it possible to collect important information on the Earth's radiation balance, i.e. the energy it gains and loses, particularly on a regional scale. This collection is carried out by measuring during at least one year these three terms of radiation to validate the principle of this miniaturization in view of the deployment of a heterogeneous constellation of small satellites. In addition, the mission also performs very delicate measurements of solar radiation in the ultraviolet range, whose variability directly impacts ozone and temperature in the Earth's middle atmosphere and could thus influence the meteorology of the lower atmosphere on a regional scale. Finally, this mission will test a medical device for astronauts' health prevention through the TeachWare program. This program should ultimately help preserve their health with diagnostic and decision support tools in complex situations during long duration missions, for example, to Mars. UVSQSAT is thus the first flight laboratory for this sensor, placed under the responsibility of Carter Ruxell and piloted by LATMOS, thanks to its space know-how. The UVSQSAT mission is part of the INSPIRE program and is part of an international cooperation. An 
awareness raising and outreach program has been implemented in schools and associations. The goal is to encourage vocations among the youngest members of the community. UVSQ SAT mission is composed of academics, industrials and students from various disciplines and backgrounds. The UVSQ SAT team has been able to benefit from the unfailing support of many professional bodies. The UVSQ SAT mission addresses three interrelated domains, research, industry and education. In the latter case, the researchers collaborated with about 50 students to train them in the testing and assembly of the various satellite components, the development of the simulation tools needed to perform the in-orbit testing, and the preparation of the scientific exploitation of the data. During the satellite's environmental tests, LATMOS was able to benefit from the assistance of the Guyancourt test platform, CNES and ONERA. After a multitude of tests and calibration trials, the satellite acquired sufficient technological maturity to be put into orbit. UVSQ SAT took off aboard SpaceX's Falcon 9 rocket. It was launched into orbit in January 2021. Eventually, the LATMOS team does not intend to stop there. By 2022, it hopes to launch at least one more satellite to begin building a heterogeneous constellation capable of more accurately measuring the Earth's energy imbalance and thus future climate trends. Thanks to nanosatellites, it seems increasingly possible to revolutionize the space field by reducing costs and development cycles to respond much more quickly to scientific So thank you, you have a short movie huh, like this. That's okay, Dan, for me. Huh? If you have question. Okay. Seems Dan has disappeared. Yeah, we seem to have lost Dan. Okay, well, Dan no, tries to, to take, uh, reconnect. To take this, uh, opportunity, I have a question uh, for, for this uh, UVSQ set. Uh, th this uh, stage is a uh, still demonstration, huh? it's a pathfinder, is it? Uh, yes, it is a pathfinder. So we do yes. that one with the Inspire team. Huh? All people yes. Inspire group. Yes, it, if it's uh, if uh, for the scientific objective is uh, very uh, attractive, uh, you want to uh, measure the relations between the sun and reflected sun energy and so on. So how many, uh, finally, how many satellites you need to fulfill this uh, scientific objective? For doing that one, there is two problems. First step is to have a, a minimum of 50 spacecraft. And to okay. solve the problem, you need also to have sensors with narrow band filters and sometimes with broad band filters. And what is very important also, this is the BRDF, so the field of view. If okay, so there's a, there's a threshold. So at least 50, and uh, with a uh, with a good payload, then you can uh, you can uh, find out the solution. So yeah. bef before that, it's a still always uh, a, a test, uh, a demonstration. Yes, it's a test, and we would like to see how we can imagine to to follow uh, another yeah. solution after with that yeah. constellation and to yeah. and to and so to that's add the... that one with space weather also. Huh? Yes. So my my for this uh, scientific objective. So there's a threshold. So that, that is the uh, important uh, key question. So you need, and also the orbit are different. So you cannot launch them in one go. You have to launch them in several different orbit plans. So that increase the, the difficulties. You have to find launch opportunities to, to place them in different uh, orbit plans. Is that true? It is really, it is true, yes, but it's possible with one system, for example, to displace uh, the spacecraft in orbit. Ah, okay. Modify. So that, that's orbit. another extra cost. So you need a dispenser yes. to uh, to replace them, to place them in different orbit. Exactly, yeah. because we, we, we need for that one to modify the the local time of ascending node, which is yes, one yes, parameter. Yes, yes, that's true. And yeah, after yeah. also inclination. 
Yeah, so there are two difficulties. One is to place them in, in place in different orbit, and then there is a, there's a minimum number. So once you have that, you can reach your scientific objective. Exactly. Okay. And what is very interesting with the launch with the 143 uh, spacecraft, uh, when they are all be launched, I think uh, Lorraine also could explain this problem. Um, first, difficulties for us, is, it was to, to show where we have our spacecraft because we need to provide the TLE of our spacecraft and to identify it. So this one was very difficult and during six days, we need to, to, to explain that. I don't know if, Lorraine, you're still on the meeting or not? Yes, I'm still here. So I think you have also this problem, but now it is solved. Um, yeah, there's some uncertainty about which set of orbit elements from the launch corresponds to our spacecraft. And so this does uh, impact our communications in terms of predicting when and where we should point our antennas. So that one was very difficult because we need also to add Doppler correction and a lot of parameters. So it was not easy at the beginning. That is true. And uh, so in our case, we're fortunate that we have onboard GPS, which we can use for orbit determination. But of course, if the spacecraft doesn't have that, then that makes life a lot more difficult. Okay. Um, Dan had to leave uh, to prepare a talk for tomorrow. He proposes that Amal, if Amal agrees, continues to, uh, to chair the meeting. Uh, what I just want to recall is that we had uh, said we would also hear from uh, Dr. Dai Lei. So um, uh, Amal, if you agree, and uh, Lei, could you, could you put your slides up, please? Uh, okay. I'm going to drop off also because it's almost it's my bedtime. <laughs> <laughs> and I saw Dice talk before. So thanks everybody for the conversation. Good to see you all. Bye, Robin. Bye. Bye, Robin. Bye, Robin. Okay, so can can everyone see my screen? Yes, we do. Yes. Okay. Uh, okay, I'll start. So, uh, so I'll be talking about uh, a science application of CubeSat constellations. So this application is called the nonlinear fitting method. Um, I'll be also talking about uh, M mission, so which are uh, CubeSat constellation missions. But here, we, uh, but here this mission is still in the, in the stage of a proposal. Uh, we have finished you know, the pre-phase studies and uh, we hope that you know, the project can move forward and uh, to the phase study. Okay, I'll I'll be start talking by uh I'll, I'll start you know, talking um the turbulence you know, in ordinary fluid, so there are the parameters you know, called you know, uh, lunar numbers uh, so it's defined by the uh, uh inertia terms you know, uh, the ratio of the inertia terms you know, to the um to the viscosity terms, so when this number is large you know the ordinary fluid is always in a state of turbulence. So the left figures you know, shows a, a turbulence of cloud as taken by satellite from remote sensing. Uh, if we look into this turbulence, we can see a uh, kind of you know, different structures. Uh, these structures are called flow eddies. You know, come across you know, a model of turbulence or uh, the energies you know, first you know, inject you know, uh, at the large scale and then and then, and then the uh, large scale uh, eddies you know, involve and the breaks you know, into small scale eddies and the energies you know, cascade you know, from large scale to small scales. And uh, these are pretty, uh, are pretty you know, uh, uh, well understood you know, in ordinary fluid. Uh, in our space plasma, uh, we have a similar situation. Uh, we, ca we can define a magnetic lunar number. So it's uh, an it's defined you know, by the uh, inertia term, a uh, ratio of the inertia term uh, to the magnetic diffusion term. Uh, this number is actually usually quite large. So in the space plasma, in the space plasma, you know, it's always you know, in a turbulent state. Uh, if we look into you know, the plasma turbulence, actually we can saw we can see a uh, different kind of all kinds of structures. And this turbulent structure include um, magnetic flux rope, uh, magnetic island. Uh, discontinuities, uh, magnetic holes, but 
but these you know, these structures are not quite you know, understood as flow eddies. I think one reason for this is that you know we only have a limited number of points you know, in the space limited number of point measurements in the space plasma. Uh, for instance, we we usually you know, apply you know, the four point measurement, uh, the linear interpolation, to estimate you know, the gradient of, of the magnetic field to infer the structures of turbulence. But if I, but if the spacecraft constellation has a uh, has a has a size you know, comparable or larger and their structures, then the, the linear interpolations, you know, have, then the in, linear interpolation is not accurate. So if we think about uh, the four point you know, linear interpolations, we can always you know, express you know, the magnetic field as a, tail ex, as a tail expansion around another point. So if we only keep the linear terms, uh, if we look at, the, look at these equations, if we keep, keep, keep the linear terms, then we need, you know, there are three coefficients, you know, A, B, and C. Then we, we need, you know, three equations, you know, to solve the coefficient. And if we consider the magnetic field there, if we consider the magnetic field uh, at orange as a measurement of the one spacecraft, then we need a total of four spacecrafts, you know, to, uh, to make the linear interpolation. And uh, if we go to the, if we go to the second order fading method, that, you know, we keep, we keep the second order uh, coefficients, you know, in the in the tail expansions, then we have uh, we have nine coefficients, you know, in the expansions. Then and considering this, then we need a total of ten spacecraft, you know, to make a, to make the second order fitting. And uh, in a similar in a similar manner, uh, if we want to go to the higher order interpolations, you know, like you know, if we want to do the third order fitting, then we need nineteen equations. Then that. Then that tells us, you know, we need you know, a total of twenty spacecrafts, you know, to make the to make the to make the third order uh, interpolations. So the summary, the short summary, is that you know, we need a constellation of many cubesats, you know, to analyze the structures in turbulence. So here, so we propose a an, uh, an mission. Uh, the front name is you know, self-adaptive magnetic recognition explorer. So it consists of twelve cubesats. Plus, you know, one mother satellite. There are two science goals for this mission. Uh, the first science goal is a cross-scale physics, as in when, where, and how fast magnetic recognition occurs. And the second science goal is uh, is to uh, study the structures uh, and the turbulence, you know, in the space plasma. Uh, the twelve cubesats, you know, are going to form th uh, three tetrahedrons uh, at three different scales. The first tetrahedron is at electron scales uh, from one to five kilometers. Uh, the second tetrahedron is on the ion scales from 100 to 500 kilometers. And the third tetrahedron is from 5,000 5, to 20,000 kilometers. It's on the, M it's on the M MHD micro scales. Okay, so the first goal is to determine you know, the cross scale physics uh, as in when, where, and how fast uh, recognition occurs. So in the left, uh, in the last figures, uh, uh, I, I list you know, the different process you know, in the recognition. Um, the, the, um, the horizontal axis you know, is the uh, spatial scales and the vertical axis you know, is the time scales. So on the large scales, uh, we have the solar wind conditions and upstream conditions and external perturbations. Uh, these are, uh, these are, are on, uh, they are the, the preconditions for recognition and they are at the large scale. And on a smaller scale from ion scale to the, uh, to the metal scale, uh, we have phenomena called you know, country thinning um, and the formation of recognition outflows. Uh, and on the smaller scales, on the electron scale and the ion scales, you know, we have micro scale you know, instabilities. Uh, we have different you know, kinetic you know, signals uh, of electron distributions and ion distributions. So all these processes, you know, are actually are related are related to the question as how to uh, how the recognition is triggered, um, but we don't know, you know, which you know, occurs first and which occurs you know, later. So with this kind of uh, constellations, you know, we can determine um, the relationships uh, with this uh, with these phenomena, and uh, we can then we can study you know or the question the onset of recognition that you know when do when when do recognition occur. So on the right figures, uh, I 
we we can also you know with these constellations we can also study you know the extension of the luminescent x lines here. So we don't know actually the luminescent line you know is a is a large scale or laminar x line or or it's a patchy x lines. Uh, this is very important questions because you know it related to how much you new know, energies are converted or how much energies are are transported you know, from the solar wind to the magnetosphere. Um, the second task goal is to study you know, the turbulence and the structures you know, in the space plasma. Um, actually, we have some do you know, these simulations you know, with the second order fitting method. And uh, we can apply you know, this method you know, to, uh, um, to study you know, the structures of flux slopes. Uh, this is some study results, early, early results here. And uh, with this uh, with this method, we can actually study you new. Know, we can reveal you know the interlinked you new know, flux rope you know uh, as in you know uh, as in these studies. Okay, so this the proposed you new know, orbits you know for the M constellation missions actually it's a uh, it's a near equatorial planes and uh, and it's uh, it's targets you know on the regions at ten Earth radii you know from the uh, at the sub at the sub at the sub Subsolar point region, and it's also you new know, target you new know, on the on the mantle tails you know about you know twenty to uh, to to thirty Earth radii from the Earth. Um, we have finished you know the pre phase day study, and uh, we have uh, uh we have we have now we have the uh, the spacecraft structures and uh, and also the cubesat. Uh, we will have twelve cubesat you new. Know, uh, launched together uh, with the spacecraft, um, and uh, and when and, and when they are in orbit, you know the mother satellite, you know is going to deploy, you know all the all the cubesat. Um, there are two major payload, you know, for the spacecraft. You know, one one payload uh, is the magnetometers, which you know measures, you know, the three dimensional magnetic field. Um, the other the other detector is the plasma detector, which measures, you know, the three dimensional distribu distribution of the plasmas. Um, okay, I think now uh, in the in the near space plasma, you know, we have cluster spacecraft, which are four point measurement uh, uh, constellations. You know, it's uh, it's between ion scale and the metal scale. Uh, we have semi spacecraft, uh, which is a five point, you know, but it's not constellation, but it's a five point measurement, uh, mostly, you know, at the micro scales. And uh, we also have you know MMS missions, which is which is a four point, you know, constellations uh, at the electron scales. And now we want to propose you new know, the M mission, which have a thirteen point, and uh, and with this you new know, uh, three tetrahedron, uh, this mission can cover us you new know, from the electron scale to ion scale and also the micro scales, and uh, and we are open to you new know, international collaboration collaborations, and uh, we think you new know, more keep that you know, may join the framework of our M proposal. Thank you. That's my thank you for listening. Thank you, Dr. Dai. Yes, thank you very much. I, I have one short question. Uh, you explained that you use the Kolmogorov model. Uh, you can use another model for doing that job? Uh, uh, yes, I, and the Kolmogorov model is, you know, I think, you know, it's a pretty good, you know, standard picture, you know, for understanding the turbulence, you know, in, in ordinary fluid. Uh, but I think in the space plasmas, we have not, you know, established, you know, such a standard models. Um, we still don't know what's you new know, the uh, uh, whether you know, the structures you know how the structures are cascading you know, from the large scale to small scale, and uh, um, um, we, are, we don't know you know what's the what's the what's the power law you know for that for for this kind of you new know, cascading. I think I think you know it's mainly because we we don't have enough you new know, knowledge you know about you know the turbulent structures you know in the in the space plasmas. Yes, I had a question, and that was um, th these cubesats are going to be basically around the subsolar magnetopause, so approximately 10 Earth radii uh, out. Are you envisaging them communicating directly to Earth or, direct or to the mothership, the mother satellite? Uh, thank you. I think that's a very good question. Uh, actually, now we are concerning, you know, we are concerning both options. So. So one option is you know, to convert you know, all the data to the mud satellite and then transmit you know, the data you know, back from the mud satellite to the, to the ground stations. Um, 
Um, but we, but we are also considering, but, but that requires you know, some sort of you know, uh, intercommunication you know, system between the, you know, the CubeSat and the, and, the, and the mother satellite. And, uh, um, and, and, it, and it's not easy. And, uh, it's, and it's also going to increase you know, the mass and, uh, and the power assumptions you know, of the CubeSat. Um, so, 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 so yes, so, so both options you know, have you new know, advantages, but, but now we are considering both. Okay, I have a question. Actually, what is the minimum life duration required to meet these scientific objectives of your mission? Uh, okay, thank you. So thank you for this question. I think you know, we plan to have this mission at least for three years. For three years, you know, for the, uh, for uh, um, um, to get out to get to get our size goal. So three years is the lifetime. Um, so, so that requires, you know, we do some, you know, uh, additional work, you know, for the CubeSat because, you know, usually um, for the CubeSat, you know, we probably need some, you know, uh, some um, the, uh, the protection, you know, from the radiation belt. I think that's a, the that's a main reason, you know, for the lifetime. And, uh, but we are also thinking about, you know, to, uh, um, uh, to increase, you know, the uh, the, the apogee, you know, of, of of the orbit, so that you know you can you know, avoid you know the inner inner radiation belt, you know, so that you know the lifetime you know, can uh, can can increase you know, with this you new know, cubesat. Okay. Thank you. Um, I think I think that wraps up all the presentations that we have, um, and I think it's been a very interesting discussion. So I'd like to ask you know everybody participating their thoughts on you know going forward. I think we have a pretty good path charted out uh, where you know I think getting the science objectives nailed down for the task group is of immense priority. Um, uh, but talking to the agencies to secure launch is not mutually exclusive to nailing down the the objectives. Uh, and we are planning to take a stab at, you know, incorporating both the QB50 model as well as the Inspire model. And these are, and, and, and you know, we want to be flexible enough to, uh, to adopt approaches that, that seem to work for us and not, not be rigid and, uh, and, and, you know, and stick to one size fits all, right? We want to definitely have a flexible approach going forward. So, uh, you know, I'm keen to hear if you uh, have, you know, any, any more thoughts on all of these. Same result. Yes, this is uh, no, what uh, Dr. Daly said is uh, proposed is, uh, is uh, one of the ideas. So this is, may not be the only idea or the fixed idea, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's a kind of example we should consider to have a, a more um, a flexible way to adapt uh, in our constellation. So one country or one agency can provide several or one, uh, one uh, institute can provide only one satellite and uh, even uh, one satellite can be joined with several institutes, several from several countries. They all possible. So uh, we should uh, accommodate all this kind of collaboration. And COSPAR is sitting in the center to organize all this. Yeah. Um, if I could say a comment regarding the mission definition. So it's been about close to six months since we've had our first town hall meetings. And uh, while there has been a lot of interest from the scientific and even the industrial communities worldwide, I think what we haven't seen over the six months really is nailing down a concrete uh, set of objectives or uh, even payloads that can be included. We have tried to reach out to the scientific community, but in general, uh, it's been more along the lines of us going to give a presentation somewhere and then asking for input, and then basically uh, people saying one or two things afterwards and then no real um, uh, organized action afterwards. Um, so perhaps it would be a good idea to uh, for this uh, task group to, I know we don't want, we're, we're always talking about this being a bottoms up effort, but perhaps in order to, uh, to encourage the sort of bottoms up growth that we want, 
it might be a good idea if this committee worked to identify uh, proactively a few payloads or a few objectives that would be worth um, uh, br bringing forward and uh, and uh, presenting to uh, the scientific community in general as these are all possible um, payloads or objectives that could potentially be addressed by this uh, by the community and then requesting input. So I think again, if we go more towards the QB50 approach, it would be good to identify payloads that we feel um, could provide useful data and then identifying what these data sets are and then bringing that forward to the community to get their ideas in terms of um, how the ideas could better be refined or how this could be implemented in a constellation setting. And I think we also had a previous discussion um, of this uh, with uh, Jean-Claude about potentially trying to make this a little more concrete. For example, having a special issue of ASR devoted towards such mission concepts or so forth, just so people feel that this is actually taking place and is not just um, another set of uh, vaporware basically. I completely agree, Lauren. I think we have reached out to the community. I think we've had multiple town halls and we've engaged with uh, many different groups. Um, so at some levels, if we have identified space, whether as our primary objectives for the first constellation, it's also important to show the feasibility and that we can make something like this with, you know, under the umbrella of Coast Park work. Uh, so in terms of moving forward, I, I would agree with you that the, uh, the task group can take the high level objective, define the high level objective and set and the set of instrument. And as Ivor mentioned in, you know, when he, in his comment, that QB50 model of where we can sell, have a select set of instruments and the partners can be free to choose which ones they fly and fly their own, right? I think that's an approach that, that merges well with the Inspire approach where, you know, we have kind of uh, standardized buses and, and, and things, at least for the first constellation, that gives us an approach to move forward um, and, and get something together uh, with the constellation going up. So I'm, I'm in complete agreement. If, if I can say something, I think that's, um, that's very useful. So, um, um, and Eva will, I think, agree. Uh, a few years ago, before we actually had a space agency in Australia, uh, Eva and I um, uh, put forward a proposal for a space weather type mission uh, based upon input from the Australian space science community. And I think the community is still very keen to pursue something like this. Um, but fundamentally, we have three barriers. And the first barrier is um, to present the clear scientific case, the clear objectives which are in, you know, part of an international need. The second barrier is to demonstrate the heritage and the technical capability, uh, which you can build up iteratively. But if you're part of an international community, it's much easier to leverage. And then that brings us to the third barrier, which is obtaining local funding. And if you're part of an international program or an international objective and you're contributing to that, you have an, your own contribution to make, but it's under the umbrella of a, of a major international uh, organization, then I think that really assists a lot with, um, with uh, local funding applications. I agree. And yes, I, I fully to... agree that uh, we should move forward. Uh, this is uh, we have been uh, talking uh, in the last uh, several uh, our working group meetings, task group meetings. So after COSPAR, we should uh, move forward. Yes. Yep. Okay. What do you agree? Would it be possible to set up a centralized collection point where we can um, propose where we can we can uh, contribute data for uh, payloads? that have potential for use on this constellation, including specifications, past mission heritage, any relevant papers, or even potentially encouraging a special issue of ASR where such instruments and concepts could be presented. Yes. For, pay, for, for payload we have, uh, for space weather, there are some very fundamental payload which has to be used. For example, magnetometers, plasma, detectors, electron detectors, all these are very fundamental. So no matter what kind of scientific objective you go, you need all these informations. So uh, I think this is a must, we, we need all this, so we can have a call for that. And uh, yeah, so I fully agree. 
Yeah, I think magnetometers, you know, DC and AC, um, earth magnetic field measurements, particle detectors, and accelerometers for thermospheric densities, these would be excellent choices for a LEO constellation and addressing space weather. That that has real operational needs, right? If you if you look from a NOAA perspective, for example, those have uh, operational needs as well. Um, so I think those would be excellent choices for instruments going forward. Absolutely, and I think we can also throw in uh, the potential for um, instruments of different uh, levels of complexity in terms of the spacecraft required to support them. So uh, again, there are instruments that uh, have um, higher requirements in terms of data rate or uh, attitude control or determination, which could be certainly be included. And at the same time, we could also look into the possibility for a few uh, less requirement heavy uh, payloads that could still provide useful information, for example, GPS receivers or uh, magnetometers, as you mentioned, and uh, potentially uh, also, uh, for example, um, uh, radiometers uh, and so forth uh, that uh, could essentially be placed as sort of an a la carte uh, sort of uh, menu that uh, participants could choose between depending upon how much they have in terms of resources and capability to contribute. Uh, yeah. This is Ben. If I can, uh, by the way, I think this is exactly the way you should go, and I, I encourage you to do so. You must have to also deal with this as how does it play in a constellation? It's not going to, if, if it's going to be successful, it isn't going to be just a, a series of individual spacecraft. So then you get into things like data rate, data transmission, you know, uh, various things that, you know, what would make it a successful constellation out of this in terms of. Uh, you know, the, uh, Gene had talked about uh, the density of measurements, uh, you know, for the, for the Earth radiation. But, well, you know, maybe you ought to think about what, what would really make this work. How much would you need in terms of, uh, you know, uh, doing this in terms of density of, of measurements? So sort of, a, sort of scope the problem, you know, that you're trying to sell to the, to the community. But I, I think you, you actually, you know, I think this is great. This is, it, 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 it put some substance in it and, and, you know, then you can find out whether there's takers, you, people want to play and, uh, and then you take, you know, go to the next step, you know, how do you put it together? And, uh, and, and that's where, you know, as, as G said, you know, the, I, it's, it's makes me really happy to say this is a Coast Bar led event. That's a, that's a, that's a good thing. So anyway. If I can give an example of a ground based um, community, and that's the super darn ionospheric radar community. So back in 1989, I think, um, the outline of a ionospheric over the horizon radar for research was developed. And that then became a standard pattern for people who wish to contribute to that super ionospheric radar community. So in essence, it was a template. So people were um, used that template and the instruments operated in a common mode collecting data for the community, but individual groups were uh, encouraged to, um, to add iterative capability. And so this built up the, um, the technical and the scientific capability. And so that's now become an international network with uh, radars in both hemispheres contributing to a data set that wouldn't otherwise be available, which are global convection maps. And so that's how you can, in effect, build up your constellation and do things that wouldn't be capable, uh, wouldn't be possible if, if you have individual groups doing their own thing. So you basically have a, um, a template, let's say a minimum standard template, which needs to be met and you have standard protocols for things like data collection, data transmission uh, formats and so on. Uh, and in essence, that could become a community data set. Um, but then groups are encouraged to add on to that their own particular uh, values, their own, um, uh, their own additions, if they wish to do that. And, um, and that also helps people an awful lot when they go and ask for money from their local communities uh, if they can demonstrate they're part of a large international uh, or a growing international set. Uh, that makes the argument much more compelling at, um, uh, locally. So perhaps, oh, sorry. Um, so just uh, perhaps uh, just following on this line of thought, 
it would be it would be good for us to assemble perhaps a essentially either a paper or even a report in space uh, research today detailing possible payload options where we've contacted the payload PI and they are they've indicated that they are willing to participate and we have a few relevant scientific questions related to each payload and then maybe just compiling that in a single document that uh, people can refer to when they're writing up their proposals to their funding agencies and at the same time essentially to get the entire uh, process into motion. Uh, no, I, I think it, it should not be a payload drive. It should be scientific objective drive. So we should uh, have a, a central uh, idea of uh, what uh, space weather we would, what topic we would do under space weather. And then that will give you an idea what kind of payload can be contributed, can be the main uh, scientific payload. Of course, if some institute can develop another one, it's okay. So as a cube size 50, you will have the freedom to add on your own uh, a sub scientific objective. So, uh, but the main objective should be uh, organize all these kind of satellite together, either 30, 50, 40, 50, 70, 60, 70. So the more the better. So those payloads are contributing to the constellation. So if we drive uh, by the payload, then uh, we will lose the idea uh, what uh, contribution they are doing all together. So um, maybe it's still better to discuss the scientific uh, objective first to have a definition or to have a consensus on that. And then that will define what payload we will use. Okay, in terms of the scientific objective then, um, then the question becomes uh, what, I mean, we've, there have been several papers and reports over the past uh, year or so identifying um, relevant space weather questions, but at the same time, a lot of them are very broad based. Would it perhaps be good for us to circulate, for example, the reports from the COSPAR uh, Science we uh, Space Weather Subcommittee, and then perhaps members of this committee highlighting particular points they feel are particularly relevant, and then we can start uh, moving in terms of uh, defining actual questions um, from that perspective? Yes, this is a one way to go. Another way is to, uh, to uh, our team members, uh, task group members to propose some key persons and they sit together to, to discuss a few, uh, few uh, main topics and then uh, send out a call for proposals to the broad community because they, they are all working in this field. They know all this. So they may come, come with a consensus, a more or less consensus. And that will, will be good enough because all these people, uh, the, the community is there. So we don't need to reorganize them or to, uh, to, uh, to investigate them. So they are there. I, I right. have to, uh, I, I, I hate to step into this discussion because we are having a very robust one, but uh, I have to step in and say that we are at the scheduled time of close for this uh, breakout session. So if you want to keep going, you know, I think, I think, I think I'm, I'm all for that. But, uh, you know, when the participants don't realize, I think it's a good sign. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I think some of Lauren's frustration has been that, you know, we did, we have reached out to the community with not a set of substantiative feedback till now. Um, so, and, and I think Lauren is very keen to start moving forward and, and, and defining the objectives if the community doesn't define it for us. Is that, is that right, Lauren? More or less, yes. And I think it's sort of a two-way thing. If the community feels that so, so far it's been a lot of big talk and high-minded ideals from uh, this task group, that's good, but I don't think they're going to uh, jump in into any substantive way unless uh, we get the ball rolling and people feel that this thing is actually uh, moving in a, a direction towards an actual implementation. Yeah. Uh, this is, uh, maybe I could <laughs> jump in here just a bit myself. It's a uh, space weather issue is, is uh, uh, by the way, I, I agree with you. You have to define the objective, but you also have to, yeah, the, there's a certain, um, uh, difference in sp approach to space weather. Some sp some people uh, are concerned with catastrophic events, you know, the wipe out humanity sort of thing, or at least your power line. And uh, and uh, and 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 there's a, there's a growing uh, 
need, I think, a more realistic need actually for um, uh, you know, sort of day-to-day -day variations. It's the difference between is you want your weather service to predict hurricanes, you want it to predict what's going to rain tomorrow. And so there is a there's a real need to uh, sort of focus on. I think in your case, you want to focus on the day-to-day uh, -day variations. There are also you know, you're, you're getting kind of close to military here, and I and I it's not that I want to get anywhere near that. But the real issue is situational awareness when you talk about military app. And, and basically, it's a, it's a very simple idea. You know, if your satellite gets, gets wiped out by a space weather event, was it an act of God or was it an act of war? And there, there's two different responses to that. And so, uh, you know, so I think if you, you, you can sort of narrow down yourself, what part of this problem do you want to want to address? And 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 then you get into uh, you know if, if it really is uh, you know uh, you know measurements with day to day variations in the atmosphere and, and that by the way is extremely important space weather events because the growing uh, uh, use of uh, GPS for self driving cars you know what do you get a good little variation in the atmosphere and everybody crosses the lane and crashes into each other it's you know it's not a not a good day. And so, uh, you know, if, if you, you have to decide which sort of space weather problem, I think, and you can make that decision that you think you want to focus on, that then feeds down into a set of requirements that is pretty easy to define after you get to that point. I mean, if you're talking about, you know, talking about in the ionosphere and you're talking about density of measurements and there are certain basic parameters that people have said of the, of the ionosphere that are used to, you know, determine the, the electron density and a variety of other things, the things that would really affect, uh, you know, GPS and other things. And, and uh, you know, you can sort of decide which problem that you want. And I don't think that comes necessarily from the community. The community is, is divergent on this thing. You know, some of them are focused on the catastrophic. Some of them are focused on other things. But I, I think you can figure this out as to which problem you want to do, uh, and, and then, and after that, it gets simple. I mean, if you say, we're interested in the density of measurements of the ionosphere, and, uh, you know, that sort of, you know, they, and, you know then, you, then you can begin to talk about, you know, how many satellites would you need, you know, that's just, what are the spatial variations of the variations that, you know, are, in, are important to measure, and what are the parameters, and, and I think you can go very quickly to the you know beginning of talking about you know what kind of constellation you want, what kind of measurement you want, if you just decide which space weather problem you want to address. In some ways, it's a matter of setting the big picture, which I think, uh, gee, you were, you were talking about really pick, picking the big picture. We've got to have the big picture. It's then a matter of of deciding what the slightly lower level goals or scientific objectives are and um we have to choose some yes. um, but they don't have to be the right ones for everybody as as long as they're recognized as being good goals suitable goals that can be complemented by the specific goals that other groups might have like one institution might be very interested in, let's say, the very cold electron distribution or, or density and temperature in the ionosphere, but another one cares about um, magnetic field fluctuations. Well, yeah. they're both interesting. You choose one, and as long as it complements yeah. the other ones, then both groups are happy with it and can get behind the, uh, the overall proposal, and then they can put their own, win on, own one on the side which then links into that one. Yeah, so I would, of course, you have the big picture and then a set of, of um, specific goals that links into specific payloads, or sorry, specific requirements, like Len was saying, which links into perhaps specific payloads. As long as others can link in with it, that's probably the best approach because it gives it a, it's flexible enough that it gives you a yeah, overall agree. framework. Yeah, I agree. We we need yeah. uh, the biggest consensus, but still leave rooms uh, for for individuals to play their own. Uh, but uh, it should be it's our coast science uh, community, so it should be has some uh, 
not only monitoring, not only a forecast, but should have some science there to get data back. People can join the analysis, the, 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 the whole data, not only their data, but uh, the data is shared. So there's some science there. So we need to have the biggest consensus. We need to discuss it later, not, not today. Okay, go ahead, uh, Amel. <laughs> I agree also with you, huh? but I have another uh, last thing huh? because we discuss uh, about CubeSat, but there is also MicroSat huh? because MicroSat is a small solution, small satellite. And as an example, a telescope observing at Liman Alpha on board a small sat represents the best option for predicting the occurrence and properties of large flare and CMEs. And what is very interesting is to have their propagation if they are geo-effective. So possible also to study other solution with other spacecraft. And for me, microsat is also small sat. Mm -hmm. We can have both, yeah. Yeah, I, I think um, we, you know, we this has given us a lot of uh, discussion points for our next meeting, for the task group meeting. And, you know, I have a list of action items that I have taken from this. Uh, one of the things that we really should act upon, you know, is, look at the big picture, but pick our, you know, we have to pick one and we have to justify what we pick and, and move forward, right? Um, and, and I agree with G's uh, point that the way to approach it might be that we give a call for proposals to the community with a definite uh, deadline for submission of those calls. And then the task group evaluates it. And then, you know, we are able to justify what we pick. Uh, from it. So we can have a call out for the community having specific guidelines along specific topic lines and then evaluate what we get uh, as a response for the community. You know, so that may be one, one action item that the task group should do immediately. Can I ask what it, in some sense it means to have a call for proposals if there's no money associated with it? <laughs> I think uh, that is just for opportunities. Oh, for, for ideas. Call for ideas. Call for ideas. Yeah, so I think that would be, yeah, phrasing is important. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. I agree. I think it certainly has to be done, but we should probably bear in mind exactly uh, how this differs from what we've been doing for the last six months. We never put a call out, Lauren. Uh, we have solicited opinions and ideas um, for uh, you know from what we should tackle. Now, I think the outcome from all of the uh, the survey that we have done from the community is that we are now choosing space weather as the objective for our first constellation, and then we can pick a few subset ideas where you know it could be ionospheric monitoring, it could be charged particles monitoring, it could be a magnetospheric monitoring. So, I mean, we can have a subset and then say, these are the areas we want to focus on. Now we are interested in specific ideas on how you would implement those, right? What kind of a constellation, what set of instruments? And then once we get that, then we can refine which one we want to pick from that. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, or do we want to have a suite of instruments that does all of these on, a, on one platform and have many of those? So, you know, it's, I guess what I'm saying is we have completed the first stage and we have arrived at space weather. <laughs> and now we are going to solicit ideas for how we implement the space weather monitor. Do you want me to contact the uh, ASR editor to uh, test this, uh, this idea of a special issue? You know, me and Lauren did a special issue on uh, small satellites for aeronomy. It takes a long time, Jean-Claude, and that's the problem. You know, by the time the special issue is out and papers start coming in, I think it's going to be a year from now, you know, a year, year and a half. So, No, I, I didn't mean exclusively, of course. This, this, the most uh, uh, immediate thing you can do is, is work on this call and launch it and gather the ideas. But in parallel, you could think about this, uh, this special issue. I think it would be a good idea. idea. Yeah, I think my suggestion for the special issue is basically to let the community feel that something concrete is coming out of this as opposed to uh, just us calling for ideas and then sort of nothing happening. Right. Yeah. Yeah. There's, a, there's a couple ways you could publish this too, uh, John Claude. I'm sure you'd agree. If, if, you, if, they, if you wrote a paper, you wrote something and uh, it wasn't necessarily uh, 
published in SRT, which takes a while, but you could we we put out a monthly or bi-monthly uh, uh, electronic, you know, which would provide you could provide a link to, and people could see see it there or something. Is that right? Uh, yeah, but that's 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 different, I, I guess, from the idea which was to let the community uh, submit articles. Uh, because here, oh, the task yeah. group has already published something in SRT. I was not proposing we do it again. Okay. All right. So the, we have to figure out how they could submit, but the call for submitting articles could go on our electronic side. Absolutely. That's, that's easy yeah. enough. Just one, I'm yeah. going to I'm gonna crash here in just a moment like everybody else, but, but uh, uh, just one thought about, you know, you talk about science objectives. I think that's that's fine, but, but if I were uh, someone trying to convince my government that I should get funding for a, a satellite to be put into this thing, I'd have to say, well, what, what's it useful for? And, you know, it would be if there was a, um, you know, contributing to an international effort to do something that, you know, helps humanity or whatever, you know, is, is probably, you're going to have more luck, I would think, getting your funding than, than presenting it as, uh, as, a, as a massive science problem. You know, I'm a scientist, I, all those, I love it, Coast Guard loves it, but uh, my experience with funding agencies is, is, you know, they wanna hear that this is, if you're part of an international constellation of something, it's, it's, it has a, has a value. You, what, yeah. Definitely. I mean, that's, well, I mean, us Australians can't really talk, but our, since we've got a two-year-old official space program, um, but that's one of the issues for us. Uh, government doesn't want to fund anything that's purely scientific in space at the moment. Uh, they want to fund something which is commercial or commercially focused. So actually getting money out of some governments is going to be tough unless we are that link out of being purely scientific. Yeah, I mean, and, and don't get me wrong. I mean, it, it's not as if we are, everything is science-based. You know, the, I mean, the, you, the, the, even if you're saying that this has got a value and it's, you know, something useful comes uh, out of it, you know, for, for other than science, it, it's all based on science, so so that so we, we're not they're not mutually mm -hmm. exclusive. It's almost how you oh, explain I agree. it. I agree. It's, it's, I explain Maybe. it, but uh, you know, I think it's I think it's important to, I mean, because I, in the big space agencies, you know, China may be an example of this. Uh, U.S. is an example. We can sell science. I mean, we have, we have a huge science program. But I would have just guessed that in, in the smaller space agencies, emerging countries and things like this, there's going to be this overlay, tell me what it's good for, what it's useful for, if you want to get funding. And so I think you owe it to the people to, who want to contribute to you to, to, to cast it in some light that they could sell it, you know, when the time comes. Yeah, we have the same issue in Singapore. Uh, they're not going to fund your science and uh, the, the missions with the atmospheric monitoring we are doing, we had to pitch it as part of spacecraft platform development with an idea to spin off a company based on how we are developing these platforms. So, uh, you know, yeah, I, I completely understand, Len. It's, uh, it's almost impossible to get funding for science in Singapore. We are on time? Yeah, uh, I yes. think... Uh, Good night, okay. and thank you for including me in your discussion. I, I thought I was just going to sit here and listen and doze yeah. off as the day went on, and uh, thank you for including me. Oh, well, thank you all. Thank you all for a great course. Course. Thank you. Thank you all for your contribution. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.